and we are back, uh, jumping right into our second conversation, and we are going to be shifting gears a little bit. We are joined by Yasser Musa, um, who is a history lecturer at uh, St. John's College, and we are going to be talking about a whole range of things, including some of the initiatives that are um, going on um, at SJC um, in terms of teaching and online teaching, and we're also going to talk a little bit about the upcoming anniversary of uh, the Image Factory. So, uh, yes, sir, good morning and thanks for joining us. Good morning, Gavin and Marlene. It is great to be with you. Although I can't see you, you can see me, and I am happy to be here with you all and with everybody else who I can't see either. So, I guess it's, we are all equal. Yeah. So it, it's just what normally happens when you come on TV. Just this time, you can't see the host either. Yes. <laughs> and you don't have to leave the comfort of your home. That's the plus side that we offer. Yes, I appreciate that very much. Now, yes, yeah, so there's a lot to talk about in terms of uh, what you've been up to, you and your team. Um, and I know that you have a, n a number of young, dynamic artists that you work with. and. Clearly, you've been taking advantage of the opportunity to create. But let's start with uh, the teacher part of you first, because okay. it's interesting to find ourselves in this situation where online schooling and at-home schooling has now become uh, the only way we can move forward. Because I just have in the back of my mind, the many years we've been talking about how things like books uh, paper textbooks were obsolete, that uh, so much can happen in an online capacity. And you'd been pushing this and talking about this for quite some time. So I wanted to just get your, your thoughts on where we are today, especially in the education sector. Well, I, I have to start by saying that I think it's a great privilege for us to be able to come into this space, this digital space, and communicate with so many thousands of people. And we sometimes take that for granted, but at a time like this, we recognize the power, the potential of the digital universe, so to speak. Yeah. And as you uh, prefaced, uh, since 2013, SJC, the school that I work at, at a, as a high school history and art teacher, uh, took the very bold decision to introduce the teaching of African and Maya history. Now, the word history itself uh, has a historical boringness about it when you talk about it in the context of school. Mm -hmm. So at that time in 2013, we decided to use a digital platform, a web-based system, in order to deliver our content and our ideas uh, as a blend with the in-class uh, sessions that we were already accustomed to. And obviously, that has been almost seven years in the making. And our website, if you go to it, Belize History SJC, you will be able to go through an archive of seven years. I mean, I don't advise it. It's very tedious. But it is an up-to-date catalog yeah. of uh, managing the two worlds, of the physical world and the digital world. And so we feel very comfortable today, having been plunged into this uh, moment. I mean, I don't say comfortable in the big word comfortable, but I mean in this specific uh, topic that I'm talking about. Yeah. But one of the things that I think we learned over the seven years is that it's not just the frills or the gimmickry or the fanciness of technology that we were really aspiring to harness, mm -hmm. rather the capacity that our real capacity in our mind the ability to think critically, to foster new ideas, is really the education. And the technology is just the tool, it's just a like conduit. a pencil, a paper, that will allow us to expand this orbit, if you want to call it, of uh, developing a new pedagogical uh, space. Yeah. Now, you, you're absolutely right. I think uh, SJC was able to kind of be ahead of the curve on this one um, in being able to uh, get, especially the history program started the way it did. The countries, that, I mean, schools across the country uh, have been trying to play catch up, and, and I think that's kind of where the concerning part is on both ends, because kids are accustomed to uh, technology, but oftentimes for different purposes. 
And not all teachers have, uh, are comfortable being able to educate through a digital platform. What's your advice to them if they're watching this morning? Well, my biggest advice is that teachers have the greatest gift, which is the gift of communication, the gift of empathy, the gift of solidarity with their students. That no technology will ever be able to replace. Because right now, I was just online in my Google Classroom. It's supposed to start at 8.30, but I asked them to start 7.30 today uh, because I had this commitment. But Did they get extra credit for watching this? <laughs> well, I told them to watch, but <laughs> they'll probably just be watching it with doing a lot of other things. But what I was saying is that they, they uh, giving me feedback as to what is happening, they miss me. And I feel so special and honored, and I miss them. Mm -hmm. And I think that human connection is really the gift of teaching. This idea that you step into the classroom to make a negotiation with the next generation. And when I was talking earlier about technology, what I wanted to drive at was that the content is generated by the teacher. So even if you just make a statement in a recording or a YouTube video or whatever, that content is really the valuable experience that you want to transmit to your students. It's not like, oh, I can make all of these fancy uh, after effects and digital things. And so there are many other people that are out there to deal with that. But yeah. the teacher is still responsible for the connection. So I think the fair is all the gadgetry and the sophistication that technology appears to to kind of shock and awe us into like oh the new thing is out so the old thing is dead and blah 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 and we get into this kind of constantly feeling insecure about oh my gosh i don't know if i can learn that to me and this seven years has taught me a lot about that i do not care if it's an uh, iphone one or an iphone 101 the issue is not the iPhone. The issue is what is the purpose of you putting something that is a content onto that platform. So I think if you uh, uh, take that approach, you will be able to even ask the young people, because many times in my own um, postings and things over the years, I have had to learn new technologies from my students. So you, you, you have all the teachers there in front of you anyway. You have 35 teachers that can teach you all kinds of things if you're prepared to listen and learn from them and then you give them what you have. That's all you can do. You can't be the best video editor and the best you know, photographer and all that stuff. That, that is very rare. That, that's interesting you say that. You know, you're the second teacher I think I've talked to who, who described it almost as symbiotic, that while you teach what you're geared to teach, you're also taking the opportunity to allow the children to teach you how to use the platform and how to uh, maneuver yourself through the technology or what will work best for them. All right, and I think that the attitude of creativity uh, needs to be at the forefront. And when I use creativity, a lot of people always mistake it. Oh, you're an artist and you write and do all this stuff, so you it sounds easy. And it's not that. Creativity is what you wake up with in your mind every morning in mm -hmm. terms of what you want to do the task for the next hour, the task for the following day. Yeah. These tasks that are built up into your mind, how you solve them and how you maneuver yourself to get to a, a point where you want to solve them, that is creativity. It's not some beautiful product that you're going to create. It is a process of action. And I really, uh, when I teach art, that's what I push. I, don't, I could care less if you can draw an apple or you can't draw an apple at all. It doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that you want to draw and that you want to explore and express an idea in your imagination and in your thought process, that something is bothering you or something has uplifted you, whatever. That to me is the essence of art and creativity. And creativity is in all of us. You don't have to be an artist to be creative. Actually, many people who are not artists are more creative than many artists. <laughs> you were gonna say many artists are not creative. <laughs> <laughs> many of them are not creative. <laughs> No, that, but, but, you know, there's so much that you said there um, that, that makes just, it makes so much sense. But it, it's kind of, we are on this rapid learning curve right now for everything. 
Um, people call it the new normal, uh, but at least we know it will be this way for some time. And change is uncomfortable, let's be honest. <laughs> and while some have made that, uh, that movement um, or that migration to an online life uh, seamlessly, some are still struggling. Um, so it, it, I think it's encouraging to hear uh, your thoughts on this. One of the areas that we know you, we've seen you um, move towards that online platform is even in terms of your publishing and your art. And this is perhaps one of the greatest times to be able to have already uh, made that move. Yes. Um, two publications I would like to talk about if I can. Yeah. Uh, the first one is uh, an e a book that we published physically, yeah. but then COVID uh, came upon us, and so we had to also publish it as an e-book. And the second publication is a collaborative uh, magazine, an e-magazine published by students, mm -hmm. junior college, SJC junior college students. So these are two very different types of publications, but because we are now in this uh, new normal, as you call it, we are able to reach far more people because more people are attentive to these platforms. So uh, if I could talk about the magazine first, uh, it's called Claire, and you can just Google yeah. Claire Belizean Students, and the, the link will appear, and you can download it for free. It's a 55-page, beautifully designed magazine. Yes, it is. By 12 uh, young Belizean uh, graphic design students. Uh, let me call their names because it's very important. Yes. Ashanti Agar, Elias Alamina, Karen Ross, Chelsea Myers, Haley Castro, Kristen Zayden, Kaylin Ramklam, Jay Wagner, Melissa Ely, Ian Ayuso, Justin Broadhurst, and Patrick Castillo. Yes. So this process, I have a, a digital publishing class at the SJC Junior College. We meet every Saturday, or we used to meet every Saturday. Mm -hmm. And when school was shut down, we were about to develop this collaborative project. Uh -huh. And so we had to migrate to WhatsApp. That's where the whole editing process took place. Oh. And just before we went to WhatsApp, uh, Jay Wagner was selected as the student that all the others, 11 others voted unanimously for him to be the artistic director. Mm -hmm. And I told him the only thing that I will do as your teacher, lecturer, whatever, is not interfere with your process. I will just watch and see what you do. So please don't ask me any questions. <laughs> and then uh, they also uh, selected Patrick Castillo uh -huh. to curate, to gather things and uh, narrow it down as content for the magazine. Mm -hmm. And what you can see when you take a look at the PDF file, the magazine, is a wide range, a spectrum of creative ideas coming together. Mm -hmm. And in my view, what is the biggest success of that is that it was driven by students, it was organized by students, it was developed, designed, and they went through this entire process of building something from scratch on WhatsApp, which is just a little circle with a, a green and a telephone object uh, onto it. But as probably they, one of the most co important connecting tools of, of modern day, at least for us yeah. in Belize. Yes. But they developed what I call not necessarily their individual art. They were gifted designers and gifted uh, technical people. I had no uh, doubt in my mind how gifted they were in that area. But the area of collaboration is what I am interested in. Yeah. And they really developed what I call a creative ecosystem of negotiating with each other. Let's do this. Let's not do that. That not look good. This look good. Blah, blah, blah. And that is where, in that nuanced negotiation, where a real creative process occurs, not just your individual creativity. That, to me, is very selfish type of creativity. Like, oh, I could draw this thing perfect and just put it in a frame and put it on my wall. Yeah. That is complete selfishness, in my view. What is more of a humanist approach to art is coming together and developing this creative ecosystem. So that's what happened, and they all got 100, and I have no uh, uh, sensitivity or... Uh, reluctance in putting that into the great book because that's to me a bigger breakthrough than any so-called masterpiece that they could have individually created. Well, that's interesting. So I was going to say that's interesting that you say that because I think that um, a lot of people would naturally tend to think that 
artists would want to be more selfish and are very protective of their own vision. And therefore, um, it would be difficult to kind of collaborate. So I'm surprised and encouraged uh, into the, that to hear um, you, you know, recount that that was the experience. Yes, it was a magical thing for me to watch. Of course, I have to give you this joke. When I, every day I wake up and see the WhatsApps, most of them occur 11, 12, 1 in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a, a, a sleep, I'm asleep at that time. But what is amazing to me is how difficult it was for me to, uh, for me to read those memes. Like, they don't communicate the way I do, like in uh -huh. words. And I was like, what the hell is this? I mean, I had no idea what they were talking about, but mm -hmm. I figured that's what their language is. And I was deeply inspired by the unknowing that I felt. Mm -hmm. I, that's really how I, I really I, I, I imagine it. I was like, wow, what the hell is going on here? But I said, okay. I told well, I do about, hope your learning curve included learning to make memes, because I, I have a, a suspicion that you're going to make some pretty good ones. <laughs> I try, but then they're very uh, awkward, and they're not <laughs> funny. <laughs> and then when I, I had uh, my daughter and I, we spent a lot of time uh, watching this TikTok. Now she, she always shows me these videos that are amazing to me. And I say, wow, how can you capture such an essence, a magic in less than 15 seconds, 10 seconds? To me, that is the art, not the stupidness they're doing. Stupidness is just for our entertainment, mm -hmm. but it's the capturing of the essence. Anyway. This yeah. wasn't a TikTok uh, conversation. But I would love to talk to, talk to you about I TikTok <laughs> another time. But this is... Um... I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know much. I'm just an a avid uh, watcher of it. Yeah, and, and I think human behavior and paying attention to what interests people is always interesting in itself. Uh, yes, but yes. going back to your, your, uh, the magazine, Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, before people think it's uh, another word. But talk to me about um, the process of watching them put it together. Because I think Gavin made a great point. Uh, creative people in general, it's not that you don't get, a, get along. It's just you always have a different way of seeing things. What, how important was it for you to kind of stand back um, even when their decision making probably got a bit hard to do? OK, I think that was very hard for me because we are as teachers compelled by grade, grades, grade book, submission of deadlines, and you know, all these things. Yeah. And so it's very, uh, you have to have a very careful balance because you are inside a, a school system. Mm -hmm. But um, to come to the point of, I have deep respect for their individual creative skill. But what I was trying to get at is that in the world we're in now, Creative skill is just one component, one element of the way you have to live. And the way you have to live, if I can say it again, you have to think of yourself being in a creative ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so you might have to be working with somebody that knows coding, how to develop a website, somebody that knows how to do video editing, a poet, a, a writer, a person that can draw, a, a teacher, because all those persons have various skills. And all those persons can also do your skill, but in a different way. Yeah. So, yes, we have to recognize the, the power of the individual skill, but we have to also acknowledge the greater power that comes from being in a, a deeper solidarity with others. Mm -hmm. So, of course, people will make music and make money and, and all that stuff of their own intellectual uh, pursuits and intellectual uh, strength. But I think more and more, if we are going to marry and merge and blend education with art and education with creativity, then we have to be open minded and free to think mm -hmm. how do we use the tactics, the strategies of the artist and the teacher simultaneously. So, how did you resist the urge of uh, intervening? I just put the silliest. Uh, we call those things emojis back at them laughing and, <laughs> and I, thinking I was trying to be cute. They never responded to me because they just accepted that I'm old. But <laughs> deeper than that, in addition to them accepting my age, I think they accepted my intention, yeah. which was to see what was best for them. Yeah. And I have to say that aside from the product of the magazine, 
what I formulated over those three weeks we worked on it was how beautiful it is to see young people be sensitive towards each other, be very embracing of each other's ideas, be very accepting of each other for who they are and bringing them into that, what I call the ecos creative ecosystem. To me, that was an uh, amazing uh, and enlightening thing. And it, it really is why we teach, mm -hmm. because we can get to see this group think. Yeah. And we think, in, in my mind, I said, it's like a line from a, a song I recently heard. We're really fostering a nation of thinkers when we do that kind of work. And I know it happens across the nation every day. Well, it's, yeah. I mean, we were just talking about groupthink in, in, in looking at economic recovery. So it's interesting that you said that. But is this, you know, everything it, it seems out of sorts in terms of what we're accustomed to. Is this the modern day um, example of what your exhibit would be? Usually you have your students, they, they create their artwork for display. Is Claire, the magazine, uh, the modern day exhibit? I think it's one, uh, one example of that. There are so many things that will unfold. These are just the first tidbits, if I can call it that, the first pieces of light that we're seeing that is emerging. You have to remember that we are all like children again, no? how every time they learn something for the first time, it seems so special and amazing. Everything's new. And so as adults, we are now being given this opportunity of course, it is in the context of a very catastrophic social and economic moment. I'm not trying to downplay that. But having said that, are we just going to sit back and be an audience to this catastrophe? Or are we going to be provocative and use creativity to inspire a deeper hope and a deeper understanding of where we want to be during this moment and at the other side of this moment? And I think that that, I think, is, the, is our call today. Um, a lot of people ask, okay, what are some of the topics you want to be teaching? I think there is no bigger topic right now uh, in education for our young people than an idea of counseling, as an example. Because counseling really fosters empathy, right? Mm -hmm. Being able to listen even in my Google Classroom. Yes, I put a topic to just fit the general structure of our lessons so that they can continue learning in that way. But I also pay a lot of time and effort in answering their basic things, their questions about what's happening, that they cook something and they burn up it and they try this ramen thing and then it gone wrong and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I mean, you have to just pay attention to that, yeah. not because the topic is interesting to you, but the idea of being empathetic to them yeah. is really the product of teaching right now. And so this concept of counseling, I know our school is going uh, into this week uh, developing a a very special counseling program, a digital counseling program, and I give uh, wow. kudos to our, our counselor for reaching out. Um, what what they did, what this administration did, was to see all the students that were not online because they didn't submit anything before the Easter when we went online, and then reach out to them by text, WhatsApp, and see how what what it is. Maybe they can um, have access to the um, web or they don't have credit. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter, and to try and bring them back into the fold of the SJC family, so to speak. And I think that is even more yeah. valuable, urgent right now uh, as our lessons are. Yes, the lessons are important, but we need to have this priority of empathy. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm so glad you said that. You know, in, in looking through the magazine, um, there were some very clear perspectives on, on even what your students think and feel, or perhaps just wanted to share, I can't say that's their personal feelings, about uh, living in this time of social distance and, and facing the pandemic. Um, what was it like for you when, when you saw some of this artwork? I was completely blown away as I am out. I always am by what they're doing because... That graduation one particularly touched me, the class of 2020. Okay. Yes, it's with all... surgical mask and isolation well it, it shows how much art can teach us and it shows how much art can reveal in terms of the mind of our youth and how much this kind of expression should be a big part of our educational process because it develops from a young age 
the sense of self-determination that I can make something and share it and negotiate an idea with the public and the community. Mm -hmm. That's really what education is all about. How do we uh, inspire in our young people a deeper sense of family, of value system, of empathy, and have them go into the society and, and, and live that experience and, and take that into action. So I think whenever I see these things, it just reminds me of the value of art education. And uh, so Claire is accessible online, so people can be able to see it for themselves. Um, yes. You know, we're, we're heading into what most likely um, is going to continue with people being at home and being online. Just, I just wanted to ask, it's a great time for people to pick up skills as well. Are you encouraging, um, are you doing any art classes online? Are you considering perhaps sharing some of your expertise or, or um, skill sets in, in an online platform as well for others who are at home? Well, um, three things I can say to that. One, I have my regular art classes that I have to do uh, online <laughs> in the classroom. Um, but there is a, a software that I just shared with my students this morning called um, Sketchbook. You can just Google Sketchbook. Mm -hmm. And it's a free app that you can download on your phone or on your computer. Uh, and it allows you to make all kinds of digital drawings. It has pen, markers, a paintbrush, a sculpture too, like uh, carving things. And it gives you different widths and lengths and colors and values. So you can make thousands of drawings without any paper, pencil or anything, because a lot of people might not have equipment right That's now. Right. It can be a very great tool for experimenting and, and exploring digital. I know a lot of people are against digital drawing, but I am not against anything. So I just think that the expression, the exploration is more valuable than you just um, feeling uh, confined to one way of expressing yourself. Yeah. Uh, but also, I think this is a good moment where I could segue to what the Image Factory is doing. Well, if, uh, if I was trying to do that segue, right? Because I was yeah. asking if you're teaching art. <laughs> and if, uh, what are we going to see? Is it going to be all digital art for your 25th anniversary? Good. Well, on the 5th of June, this uh, coming up, Image Factory will turn 25. And mm -hmm. I, I had to go and think about um, something we could do, right? And so, look at this. Let me just show you this. Yes. You can see, right? You see all of these things? That's one set. Of publications that came out. So these, are, these are all uh, publications we've done over the past 25 years. So yeah. what we're doing in the next few weeks is digitizing all that to build a archival platform for people to see. Of course, not many people go. But that's not my agenda. <laughs> my agenda is that we started 25 years ago to document, and now we're documenting ourselves having documented 25 years, if that makes any sense to you. Oh, but okay. translating it into a digital space. Yeah. However, when you look at a lot of these invitations and things that we've developed, always we would say, you are invited. And that's one of the strongest attitudes, I think, of the Image Factory. We always wanted teachers to bring their students, the media to come and see what we're doing, the wider community, whether it's by email or Facebook post, to please come and check us out. And whether it was 20 or 200 people that came to various shows, we always felt honored that people would come to see what we were doing, whether it was publishing a book, or making an exhibit, whether it's photography or sculpture or a history exhibit of fire or hurricane. So many things we've done, but each, the intention was to open up the space and invite people to come and experience. And so we are now having this online call called, you are invited, it's an open call. You can submit anything. There are no rules, so don't ask me about any rules. <laughs> Wait, what, submit anything? That you wish, whatever you feel that you want to submit to Image Factory 25 years, you submit it. And you can submit it to Image Factory 70 at yahoo.com. And you can do so by the, by, let me see, the <laughs> 23rd of May. 
you have a whole month, Marlene. You and Gavin have to submit something. Okay. Um, I'll dig up some old files. <laughs> no, you can do it. It is to all right. So it's it's ongoing. But so this there morning, are rules. That's what you're saying. Well, it's there are rules in my mind, but not. I don't want it to be um, influencing you all too much. But yeah. at, on June fifth, mm -hmm. there will be a kind of unveiling of a digital product. Let's call it that. So that will be a compilation of what's been submitted. I'm trying to be as broad as possible. And that will kind of be like a time capsule of the first COVID-19 generation art thing, yeah. so to speak. If that makes sense. So um, I encourage people to submit what they wish and to feel free to submit. We've already gotten a number of submissions. I was oh. very impressed how people are submitting. From the regular artists? Actually, the first 12 people, not, I don't know them to be artists, but I have not even been able to define myself. Well, I artist. know. I was going to say, I know you don't like titles, but people who <laughs> perhaps have produced art it before. Be, let's, it, use, let's use it, that it, definition. But, Actually, this is uh, uh, an artist that I exhibited with in Guatemala, Guatemala many years ago, Marlo Barrios, because he's on Facebook, his site, and he will submit something. So it's not just within Belize. It's not just being an artist or a musician or whatever. You can be anybody that if you came as an audience member to any image factory show and you want to just put a reflect. All right, see, I'm now I'm getting into what you should But do. It's, it's fascinating to think, though, because I, I really have been wondering that artists, whether mm -hmm. you call yourself one or not, just have yes. an amazing capacity to be able to uh, show or describe or capture feelings that some of us can't be able to express. We feel it, but we don't know how to say it or to to um, show it to another person. And when artists do that, it, it just it's an amazing connection that happens. And this collective experience of this pandemic, I, I'm so interested to see what people will be able to produce to. to uh, demonstrate to us what they have personally experienced or felt about it and how much of us will connect with of whatever course. it is they produce because many of my students I told them about the you are invited today I have almost 180 students and I sent out a call on my various Google classrooms and many of them in instinctively say there go give me an hour sir I'll get it to you they, they are not interested in seeing whether I am an artist or if I have to do it by May 23rd. That's what's fascinating to me, that they are not caught up with our, uh, I don't know if it's baggage or I don't know what it is we have. But anyway, but to me... Well, we, we had that conversation earlier as well about the, the generational gap that existed. You yes, know, yes, clearly yes. the younger ones. I, I assume you'll get a lot of memes as well. That's That's also... Um, going to be very entertaining. It's an but open call, so we have to take it, and I cannot have any kind of censorship or anything. It's an open call, so whatever it is, it is. Can you, I mean, I couldn't imagine. Reaching this milestone is an achievement um, for you and your team, and you've had so many artists that, that have worked with you at Image Factory. I mean, how do you quantify the contribution that you've made? Uh, the number of artists that have passed through. You know, one of one of my little interesting uh, facts that I know about Image Factory, because Galvano shared it with us, was that you don't even, that you, you had so much paint, where you paint over just the space over and over and over after exhibit, that it just developed like one big thick layer of paint. But the you amount should. of people who've, even if they've just, I know I did a photography show there, but that was like once in a lifetime and never again. But the people who, have done one show, people have done many shows. It's How do you quantify 25 years later? Well, that's a great question, and I think about it a lot. And um, obviously, I can, in terms of publications, we've done over 200 yeah. uh, publications, and we have exhibited, if you add up the artists, because as you said, there are many group shows, over 500 artists and writers and poets and people like Miss Meg Craig, who I'm thinking about today when I think about the Image Factory, because uh, at age 90, 89 to 92, 93, she was working still with us um, building exhibits. So it, whether you're nine or 90, uh, to me, what it shows is that the Image Factory 
attempted to open a, a creative community space. That's what I want to say. Because we never uh, turned down anybody that came to us wanting an exhibit. And we never had to go too much and aggress and find exhibits. A lot of things just happened organically. Uh, they call Gilvana or they call me and the things just started to happen and bubble up as they say on the street. And so I think that what we are doing now is figuring out the next 25 years. But if there is one thing we can learn about the first 25 years is that the despite a society that does not really care about creativity, that does not really care about their citizens being original people, original thinkers, creative thinkers, critical thinkers. Despite our better judgment on all of that, we pursued this course. Not me or not Gilvano, but the space along with the ideas that flourished inside that space and outside that space, because our work went all over the place, in the region, um, in Central America, in uh, the Caribbean, and so on. And our connections of solidarity with other artists all over. I think that speaks volumes if that could be duplicated, recreated across the land of Belize in the next 25 years. It would say, say a lot for our cultural diplomacy. Because we are all uh, satisfied with the idea of all oh, diplomats in suits going and shaking hands. And that. But that is irrelevant in the scale of human connection in terms of how nations connect to each other. So this you, this you are invited moment is kind of making a call to see how others feel about this moment. And we package it, so to speak, in order to make a, an acknowledgement of the 25 years. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that. So I'm, I'm also interested to know how you... I can't hear you too good. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. I was, saying that it, I was saying that it's interesting that you say that. I was going to ask, what, uh, how do you think you were able to, uh, to achieve uh, this milestone in, uh, you know, with regard to all of the difficulties that you had pointed out earlier? What do you think, um, you know, pushed you guys to get to 25 years um, and mm -hmm. allows you to keep thinking about 25 more. Well, for one, I have to thank my parents. From when I was very young, my mother never once uh, dissuaded me or gave, put in my mind the idea of art and teaching and things like that as being anything that has no value. As a matter of fact, the opposite. I, I grew up in a house of books. And also my father providing the space. I mean... Uh, as much as we were able to do so many projects, we had to have a space, and that space being provided, I think, with the foundation to begin with. Also, basic things like Pamela, my wife, who uh, helps a lot with all the accounting and making sure, because if, it, if it's left up to, up to me as a, the way I think, uh, we would have nothing. Uh, but she was able to say, no, this costs this and this costs that. You can't do this and you can't do that. And that's a reality. That's yeah. A, a, you have to have that kind of mind. And of course... There is a like, business side to it. People like Gilvano, who is, I always, I call from 25 years ago, the national curator. Because he, for example, as a young 20-something-year-old, was the one that single-handedly designed that first uh, museum of Belize in that old prison in 2002. I remember he and I going there, walking through it when it was all trees growing up and they had ban abandoned it as a prison. And we had this idea, okay, this will be the museum. And But I just had it as an idea. Mm -hmm. I don't have the curatorial power that he has to say, okay, this will happen, this will happen. This is how much feet of what you need, blah, blah, blah. That, so these collaborations begin from uh, trusting that you are not the so-called oracle of all ideas, but you can harness the ideas of others, which I think, I was saying with the Claire Magazine idea and the teaching uh, strategies of today yeah. is that you harness your students to be your 35 uh, teachers, then you will be more empowered because you've empowered them, if that makes any sense. No, of course, oh, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Yes, but so I think that, that is the thing. So then as we get an artist, a painter or a photographer or a music group to come in, those things build up like an onion and build up and that 
that accumulation of energy and activity and products, creative products, I think is the DNA of the image factory, that we didn't go out knowing who we are other than we want to be free to express ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think the range of exhibits that you've had uh, just at, at Image Factory itself uh, clearly shows that there was never any limitations as to what could be considered art or how someone could express themselves. Yes, sir, in, in, in all that time, is there any, uh, what, what, would you, what would be your most memorable milestone that you've made? Okay. I, I love that slide. That was almost like a, a transition on the computer, the way you sl <laughs> slide it up. <laughs> the la the, Why? It's hard, it's hard to answer that question except to say that the last thing we did, I think we should start off with, which is in terms of a publication, we published this book called Maximo, The Last Alcalde of San Jose Yalba. And I will just quickly spend one minute explaining that project. Yes. We published it. The pandemic, uh, the global meltdown happened, and we then sent it out on March 27th as a digital launch, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the, the story of Maximo, who was an alcalde, a, a village leader from the village of San Jose Yalbak, which is in the northern near Galanjog uh, area, uh, they, they were the descendants of the Kaswar of the Yucatan, a Maya village. But PEC, the British uh, powerhouse uh, uh, company, the land owning company, in the 1930s, this is almost 100 years ago, started to push to cut down the forest and displaced that entire village and exiled the people of San Jose. They became refugees in their own land and they ended up in a kind of concentration camp designed by the British in Orange Walk Town for three months mm -hmm. and they barely fed them. Many people were starving. We have the oral accounts of all that until eventually Maximo, who was the alcalde at a young age in his early 20s, 20s, imagine this. Your entire village, all the people in your village are displaced. Almost like a COVID moment has happened to us in 2020, happened to them in 1933. And they were then uh, given a new land to settle on, which is now called uh, Nuevo San Jose Palmar, which is right outside of Orange Walk. Yeah. But the granddaughter of Maximo is alive and lives in Palmar. Her name is Carmen Carrillo. Mm -hmm. And she held the story of her grandfather in her. Until now, we've reached out to her, my colleague Delmer Zib and Carlos Quiros, collaborated, Delmer wrote and helped to research along with Carmen the story. Carlos, who is also known as Lito, the graphic designer, did all the illustrations. We thank also Melissa Espat for helping to edit uh, the, the, the book. Mm -hmm. And I have to add that Carmen's dad, Misael Perez, the son of Maximo, Maximo is also alive and well today. I think he's like 81 years old. We interviewed him. And so this oral history, which was preserved by the son and the granddaughter, is now in this book. Remember, I started our, your program talking about how we as teachers, as historians, as artists, whatever, must generate our own content. Because there is billions of content that exists out there. But if we lose our sense that we can create our own content, then we will just be a satellite state of some digital Google world that, that to me will completely undermine our sovereignty, the sovereignty of our imagination. Well, I think, you know? yeah, sorry to cut you off, but I, I, mm -hmm. and I don't mean to interrupt, but I also think that it's important because you also started off by um, talking about um, sort of the innovation that took place at SJC um, in terms of teaching African and Maya history. And I think that us, um, not just Belize, but as a region have, you know, been victim of the whole colonialist um, history, revisionist um, sort of view of history and the world. So projects like this and initiatives like this are extremely important. Well, I am happy that you brought up this 
uh, colonial idea because the decolonization process, while it started in 1981 for us in independence, uh, we in 2020 have a new moment in front of us, an independence 2.0, but one of the roots that we need to respond to is that we have not properly addressed the mental decolonization of our education system. And i give you an example. Look at how Cuba as a country has been in such solidarity with the world. 22 Cuban medical brigades have been dispatched across the earth. To one of them, to Belize, one yesterday to South Africa, they have been in 14 Latin American and Central Amer uh, Caribbean countries, and they've been to the Middle East in Qatar, but also, ironically, as you brought up the colonial idea, they went to Italy when Italy was under the most right. or the heightened state of catastrophic meltdown with this COVID-19 thing, a former European power. This small island nation went there in solidarity. To me, that kind of uh, important moment is what we need to teach our young people how to be in solidarity, yes, first in our communities, in our classroom, but also with the world uh, in terms of the, the different um, agendas or ideas that you might have. So to me, we cannot lose sight of the roots of where we're coming from in order to make these flowers and these beautiful things spring. But you know, this practice, and, 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 and I love your example of Cuba, um, and I think a part of, of what seems to be an integral part of their culture is that they understand uh, the revolution. It, it's a part of what they know and believe in everyday life. They see it and the right. remnants around them. Um, this right. book, Maximo, I think this story ca has been told uh, maybe just in, in, in conversation here or there, um, but I, I have not seen anything documented before. In fact, I, I remember hearing the story the first time I went to, to uh, Palmar, and I realized that it's the kind of thing that almost seems irreverent to speak about in this day and age. Um, and it's because of the remnants of, of our colonial past. You know, it's, it's, it's taboo for some people to mention that these things did historically happen. We did have this kind of displacement happen for business interests. Um, that it did take, uh, I, I think, uh, the Indians to be able to stand up and to, to be able to create kind of uh, their own reality. And I know you've done the same in documenting some of the, uh, the issues that the caste war uh, that took place in the North. Why is it, do you think, and as a history teacher, maybe you have a better understanding, that we shy away from talking about and documenting some of these truths? Well, because the brainwashing that has occurred did not occur 10, 15, 20, 30 years. It is a project, the colonial project, uh, that has been ongoing for m more than 500 years. We have to recognize that in 1992, when the United Nations declared it the year of the indigenous peoples, what they were trying to do is kind of they do a kind of token uh, symbolic moment of the 500th anniversary of 1492. And whenever I teach history, I teach 1491, which is that there were 90 million people in the Americas living in more than a hundred different types of societies and civilization yeah. that the European met. And if you want to talk about what a pandemic looks like 500 years ago, we're talking about like, for example, the island that Haiti and Dominican Republic is on, what they call Hispaniola. In less than 10 years, almost 300,000 people died of the uh, smallpox, 300,000. And you see how we are behaving right now with 8 billion people on the planet and how many people dying of COVID? Yes, all that is tragic. But if we have no sense of history, no sense of belonging, because history is not just about the past. History is about belonging. It's about who you are, who you want to be, and who you are becoming. But you have to know the roots of your belonging, the root lines of your belonging. And if you don't know that, then, as I always tease my students, 
when I start my history class, the world did not begin when they turned on the internet. <laughs> and if we can appreciate the magnitude and responsibility that we have as educators to get our young people to start thinking critically, because there are so many things, whether it's how we teach uh, the idea of um, agriculture or the idea of lived culture or the idea of the earth, global uh, climate change, all these things, all of them, if they're not taught in the context of the root lines of how we think of ourselves and how we identify ourselves, then we will just be parroting what other societies have as their uh, modules of how to think of these things. And that's, to me, very dangerous. As always, you, you, you leave uh, so much food for thought. And I'd love to extend the conversation. But I do have one more, even though they've told me multiple times we're out of time. Um, <laughs> Just in terms of documenting history, that, that's such a key thing. This is a historic moment that we're in. Um, and, and I keep on thinking, who's going to tell this story? And how are people going to understand this story uh, of, you know, in Belize, so far, we're lucky. We're not, we're not talking about a nightly uh, debt report or the type of loss of life. But it doesn't mean that we are not going to experience or not experiencing challenges right now. In, in all that you've seen in the documentation of history, what should we be capturing at this time? And not well, we, the media, I mean collectively. Well, um, that is an impossible question you've asked at the end of this conversation. I know. Should I just uh, <laughs> leave you there to think about that all day? Honest, the, honest thing, the honest answer is I do not know. Yeah. And that's why we uh, have this running joke for 25 years at the Image Factory that we are involved in the process of BAFO, the art of trying. And that to me, the whole we you are invited is just a small sample of that. Let us bring our thing, thoughts together. Let us come together. Let us commune. And then hopefully through that communion of thinking, we can be able to better uh, navigate out of this uh, crisis and multiple crises at multiple levels across our land. But to me, it will not be any different at the end of this in the way we teach, in the way we use history and art, because those are things that, just like Carmen Carrillo held the story for so many years, we have to hold the story of now, what we're really going through in order to carry on. So maybe that is close to an answer that we have to be truthful as to what we are going through and what we are feeling so that we can pass that on That's when right. we move forward. And it will be a collection of personal uh, histories. Uh, yep. I, I, I think that I, I look forward to seeing what people are going to submit. Once again, uh, May 23rd is your deadline. That's your only rule um, in terms of submission of art, you, you expression. Gavin, <laughs> something. Hmm. What's that? That's, I said you and Gavin have committed, maybe not, um, wholeheartedly yet to submit something. <laughs> so we have time. Uh, we do have time, May 23rd. And uh, we look forward to seeing what's going to happen there. Thank you for joining us, Yasser. We appreciate the conversation. It's Stay always safe. a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. All right.